Gather round, everyone. Turn out the lights. You might want to grab a flashlight or two. Sit close to whoever's next to you, but not too close. You never know if they might turn into a werewolf or a zombie. Are you willing to take that risk? Now, prepare yourself to hear ten spine-tingling, bone-chilling, hair-raising tales about ghosts, spirits, vampires, and all sorts of other scary creatures and people. I hope it's not past your bedtime. <laughs> Everyone has heard of vampires. Many people even think vampires are real. And who knows, they just might be. This story is about one of the most famous vampires of all time, Count Dracula. Have a listen, and then think about who might live next door to you. The galloping horses pulled the coach along the dark road. We'll arrive at the castle soon. The driver shouted to his only passenger, I'll drop you off and leave at once. I must get out of these woods before the moon rises. Strange things happen during a full moon. What kinds of things? asked Jonathan Harker. The driver's voice quivered with fear as he replied, When the moon is full, wolves prowl about and bats fly through the sky. The wolves and bats travel with the vampires. Don't be superstitious, laughed Jonathan. Vampires don't exist. Jonathan was too tired to be scared anyway. He had been traveling for weeks, carrying a secret document from London. Jonathan was supposed to deliver the packet to Count Dracula of Transylvania. Whoa! The driver shouted to his horses. The coach stopped in front of a dark castle. Jonathan stepped out and looked up at several tall towers and a huge iron door. Before he could turn around to thank the driver, the coach sped away. Jonathan walked up to the large door and pulled a rope that rang a bell. The door swung open to reveal an older man in an elegant suit. Welcome to Transylvania, Mr. Harker said the man. I've been expecting you. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Count Dracula. He offered Jonathan his hand. The strength of the man's handshake sent a chill up Jonathan's spine. Jonathan looked at his host and noticed that Dracula's skin was as pale as the moon which had just risen in the night sky. He heard a wolf howl in the distance. <coughs> Bats fluttered overhead. Jonathan shuddered. Ah, listen to the welcoming sounds of the night, said the Count, staring longingly at the moon, his head tilted back to better sniff the cool night air. Suddenly, the Count turned his attention back to Jonathan. You must be very hungry after your long journey, said the Count. Come, dinner is ready. Jonathan followed the Count into the castle and to the dining hall. Heaping plates of food sat on the table. Seeing the food, Jonathan forgot his fear and began to eat. From his place at the table, the Count watched Jonathan. The Count's plate was empty, however, and he did not eat. "'Won't you join me, Count Dracula?' Jonathan asked his host. "'I will eat later,' the Count said and smiled. Two sharp white teeth glimmered in the candlelight. After dinner, the Count showed Jonathan to his room. Sleep as long as you like, said the Count. I won't be home tomorrow until after dark. Thank you for your hospitality, replied Jonathan. Before you leave, I have something for you. He handed the packet with the secret document to Count Dracula. This is from my boss, Mr. Hawkins. Ah, yes, I've been waiting for this for a very long time. 
He smiled and turned away, but not before again revealing his two sharp teeth. That night Jonathan did not sleep well. Howling wolves and swooping bats haunted his dreams. He awoke the next morning and began to explore the castle. He tried to open the doors along the hallway, but they were all locked. Finally, he came to a heavy door at the end of a hallway. The rusty latch broke off in his hand, and the door swung open to reveal a dark stairway. Jonathan followed the winding stairs deep into a basement beneath the castle. At the bottom of the stairs, he entered a dark earthen room dimly lit by torches. Several wooden boxes rested on the floor. Puzzled, Jonathan knelt near one of them. He slowly opened the lid and found himself looking into the face of Count Dracula. <gasps> Dracula was a vampire. Jonathan ran from the room. He raced up the staircase. Back in his room, he quickly packed his bag. I must leave this dreadful place at once, he said aloud. Through the window, Jonathan saw that the sun was low in the sky. Night will be here soon, he worried. I must have slept for most of the day. Jonathan ran to the big iron door. Three wooden beams had been placed across it, locking him inside the castle. He frantically searched the dark hallway, knowing that there must be some other way out of the castle. At last, Jonathan found a bin below a small door in a dark corner. This must be for coal deliveries, he said. He turned the door's tiny knob, and it swung open. Quickly, he squeezed through the door and fell to the ground outside. Jonathan heard a wolf howl in the distance and saw bats fly from the high castle towers. The sun was already sinking below the trees. He knew he must leave at once, for vampires sleep by day and walk by night. Finding a horse near the castle walls, Jonathan jumped on its back and rode from the castle to safety at last. Many weeks later, Jonathan arrived back in London. His wife, Mina, was happy to have him home again. She looked lonely and scared, and Jonathan asked her what was wrong. I was frightened by myself. Bats have been flying all over the city, she said, and I hear wolves howling at night. <laughs> Bats and wolves in London, laughed Jonathan. That's silly. Bats and wolves live in Transylvania, not London. Poor Mina. Why don't we go to the theatre tonight? That will take your mind off such strange things. Dressed in evening clothes, the couple attended a wonderful play. Afterwards, they strolled home along the city sidewalks. An old man in an elegant suit passed them on the sidewalk. Good evening, Mr. Harker, he said. Turning to face him, Jonathan saw two white teeth as the man smiled. It was Count Dracula! Jonathan could not believe his eyes. The Count had followed him to London. He walked Mina home and then ran to Mr. Hawkins's house. As he knocked on the door, Jonathan heard a wolf howl. Bats flew across the night sky. Hello, Jonathan, said Mr. Hawkins. What can I do for you? I'm sorry for the lateness of the hour, sir, said Jonathan, but I must know the meaning of the document I delivered to Count Dracula. Oh, is that all? Well, Count Dracula requested that the document remain secret, replied Mr. Hawkins, but I can tell you now. The document you gave him shows that he owns a house in London, and with that document, he's allowed to move here. He, 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 he can move here? Jonathan cried. Count Dracula is moving to London? You're going to have a new neighbor, Mr. Hawkins said with a smile. Count Dracula bought the house right next to yours. Some of the best ghost stories have been tales that have been passed down over the years. This story, titled How He Left the Hotel, could very well have been passed on from one generation to the next. Maybe this is being told by your great-great-grandfather. After the Civil War ended, I headed to New York City. My captain was from New York, and he had told me all about the city. Hey, stop by the Empire Hotel, 
he told me when I was discharged. I know some people there. Perhaps they can help you with a job. New York was as big and exciting as I had heard. I decided to take my captain's advice and stopped by the Empire Hotel. It was an elegant red brick building with a fancy lobby. Welcome, said a friendly doorman. He was dressed in a uniform with polished brass buttons and a stylish cap. My name's Joe, he said with a grin. I shook his hand and then introduced myself. I asked Joe to introduce me to the hotel manager. I've spoken to your captain, the manager said. I'd like to offer you a job. We need someone to operate the hotel elevator from two o'clock in the afternoon until twelve midnight. We'll provide wages and a room. I needed the work and a place to stay, so I quickly accepted the job. Like everything at the Empire Hotel, the elevator was modern and fancy. It had a decorative light inside and mirrors on the walls. It even had velvet cushions where visitors could rest during their ride. One November, a new tenant arrived at the Empire Hotel. His name was Colonel Saxby. Colonel Saxby was also a Civil War veteran. I knew right away because he often wore his military cloak. Colonel Saxby was a kindly gentleman who kept to himself. I figured he was in his fifties. He was tall and thin, with a gray mustache and a pointy nose. His skin was pale, which made the reddish scar on his cheek stand out. He also walked with a very slight limp. I took a bullet in the knee, he explained to me one day. Sometimes in the elevator, the colonel and I would talk a bit about the war. Even though he would talk to me, I wouldn't say he was overly friendly. That didn't bother me, though. Since I worked the elevator, I came to know everyone's routine. Colonel Saxby was especially predictable. He rode the elevator up to the fourth floor at the same time each day. He never rode it down, though. I figured he must use the stairs to come down. Time passed, and I came to love my job. I was proud to tell people I worked at the Empire Hotel. It was one of New York's finest. Sometimes operating the elevator grew dull, but I really enjoyed all the people. Every night at midnight, I always locked the elevator. Joe generally tidied up the lobby a bit, and then on Wednesdays we headed up to the community room for a game of cards. The next day, I found myself watching the front door, waiting for Colonel Saxby to arrive. The colonel always rode the elevator up at three o'clock each day. In fact, I couldn't recall a single day when he had not been on time. Today, he was not on time. I guess there's the first for everything, though. Colonel Saxby never did show up that day. He didn't show up the next day either. Have you seen Colonel Saxby lately? I finally asked Joe. No, I can't say that I have. He replied. I hear he's very ill. At the end of my shift that night, I had just started to lock up the elevator when the call bell rang on the fourth floor. I figured it must be a visitor who didn't realize the elevator stopped running at midnight. As the clock struck twelve, I rode to the fourth floor. When I opened the elevator door, I was very surprised to see Colonel Saxby. His military cape was draped over his shoulders. I noticed his skin was even paler than usual. The man looked very ill. I was concerned about him. I wondered why he was venturing out so late at night. I'm glad to see you're better, sir. I said, but Colonel Saxby just looked at me with a hollow stare. Then he boarded the elevator. It was the first time I had ever given him a ride down. When the elevator stopped in the lobby, I opened the door. Colonel Saxby, who had stood perfectly still during the ride, departed without a word. Joe opened the door, and Colonel Saxby walked out into the snowy night. Just then the doorbell rang. Joe opened the door. A gentleman with a black bag entered. I could tell at once that he was a doctor. Fourth floor, he said hastily. I'm sorry, but the elevator stopped running at midnight. I explained. This is a matter of life and death," said the doctor. I did as he requested. The doctor rushed straight to room four ten. Oh dear! I heard the doctor sigh. I'm too late. Colonel Saxby has passed away. 
The doctor covered Colonel Saxby's face with his sheet. This can't be, I said. I took the colonel down in the elevator just a few minutes ago. Joe saw him too. Colonel Saxby just left the hotel. We stood there and stared at each other as chills overtook us. After I locked up that night, I turned in my keys. I never went back to the Empire Hotel again. The story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a true classic. Some people think that there's a little bit of Mr. Hyde in all of us. It just so happens that Dr. Jekyll kept a diary of the changes he went through during one of his experiments. Have a listen to Dr. Jekyll's diary to find out what he wrote, and you can decide if there's a Mr. Hyde inside of you that's trying to get out. I am going to write everything down. If he discovers it, he'll destroy it. He wants to get rid of me so he can live forever. Mr. Hyde is not far. No, I fear he will come at any moment. I've been in my laboratory for three days just waiting for him. It all started about a year ago. Back then I had a good life in London. I was a doctor. I helped many sick people. The night my life changed forever. My butler Poole said to me, Dr. Jekyll, you help so many people. I smiled and thought, if only he knew about my other side. I ate my dinner alone that night. Then I quickly headed down to my lab. There was my magic formula. I had invented a liquid that could make me two different people. My good side would be one person. My bad side would be a totally different person. I poured special powder into the glass. It turned green, then purple, and finally red. Steam rose from the glass and hung in the air like a cloud. The smell burned my nose. I held my breath and drank it in one gulp. Oh, what a terrible pain! My body shook. I cried as I twitched and writhed, and then suddenly the pain stopped. I felt strange. I looked in the mirror and gasped. The eyes staring back at me were not Dr. Jekyll's wise brown eyes. The eyes in the mirror were gray and beady. My hair was wild. My teeth were crooked and pointy. I was hideous. But I liked the new me. I named this new face Mr. Edward Hyde. I went out the back door. I saw a horse and carriage on the side of the street. I climbed in and yelled, Take me to Soho! I spit out the window. I yelled at people on the street. Oh, how free I felt! Before I knew it, we had arrived in Soho. I jumped out of the carriage and said to the driver, Do you want your money? Yes, please, sir, he said. Instead of paying the driver, I swatted his horse with my cane and yelled, Yah! Away! Yah! The frightened horse galloped wildly down the street. <laughs> I laughed as I watched. Who was this person I'd become? Soon it was morning. I hurried home. I snuck down to my lab and drank my magic formula. I was Dr. Jekyll again. That morning I opened my office late. I went shopping for clothes that would fit Mr. Hyde. For weeks I was Mr. Hyde by night and Dr. Jekyll by day. One night Poole said to me, Sir, Mr. Otterson is here to see you. He's waiting in the study. Good evening, I said. To what do I owe this visit? Dr. Jekyll, we've been friends for a long time, Mr. Utterson said. I just wanted to see if... Anything is wrong. Nothing is wrong, I answered. If only Mr. Utterson knew the truth, but I could never tell him. I went down to the lab and quickly drank my magic formula. This time I only drank half a glass, but I changed into Mr. Hyde even faster. I wandered down the streets of London. When the sun started to rise, I began to walk back to my house. That was when all the trouble started. To be honest, I did not even see her. 
I slammed into a little child. I knocked her straight to the ground with a heavy thud. Hey, you, said a stern voice. Stop you there. Did you knock down that child? So what if I did, I replied. Then I turned and ran away. Police! Police! cried the man. A police officer chased me. You there, stop, he yelled. I ran, faster and faster and faster. If Mr. Hyde went to jail, so would the good Dr. Jekyll. I did not look back. I ran straight to my house and into the lab. I slammed the door and drank a glass of my magic formula. Nothing happened. I drank another glass. Still nothing happened. Finally, after four full glasses of the magic formula, I turned back into the good Dr. Jekyll. I knew that Mr. Hyde could get Dr. Jekyll into trouble, so I did the only thing that I could. I put away Mr. Hyde's clothes. I locked away my magic formula. It was for the best, because I was running out of the special powder and could not find any that was nearly as strong. But yet I could not get Mr. Hyde out of my head. It went on like this for months. But yesterday morning changed everything. I woke with a start. My knuckles were thick like knots, and my hands looked like claws. I glanced at the mirror, not knowing whose face I'd see. Imagine my terror when I saw Mr. Hyde, for I had not swallowed any magic formula, not one single drop. I ran out of my bedroom and down to my lab. I drank one glass of my magic formula in an attempt to get Dr. Jekyll back. Nothing happened. I drank another and another. Finally, after drinking five glasses of the formula, I changed back into Dr. Jekyll. I went back to work. An hour later, my head began to ache. I was seeing one of my older patients. Doctor, he said, is something wrong? I could not speak. I dropped his medical chart. I ran out of the office and down to my lab. Before I had even reached the laboratory door, I had changed into Mr. Hyde. I drank the last six glasses of my magic formula. I don't have any more. I know I have just a short time left. I am writing so everyone will know the horrible truth that I, Dr. Jekyll, am also Mr. Hyde. I'm just waiting for Mr. Hyde to show his ugly face again. I am afraid to shut my eyes to sleep. He'll come if I do. He can come by himself. He does not need any magic formula. He is much stronger than Dr. Jekyll ever was. I can hear Poole upstairs as I write this. I hear other people, too. I hear the stomp, 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 down the stairs. The footsteps are getting closer, 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 until they are just outside my door. They cannot meet Mr. Hyde. He could hurt them. I can hear Poole calling to me. Dr. Jekyll, are you in there? Go away, I yell back. Perhaps if he reads this diary, he'll understand. We only want to help, says another voice. It's Mr. Utterson. Go away. Go away. Why don't you listen to me? Oh, my head aches badly. I hear axes slashing at the door. What can I do? They are almost in. Mr. Hyde is very near. I can feel him. He wants to come out, and Dr. Jekyll may never return. I fear that he'll be here any minute. <laughs> Most ghost stories tend to be about scary apparitions haunting and frightening people, but not all ghosts set out to be evil. Here's a story that is very creepy, but demonstrates that ghosts can be helpful as well. It's called The Inn at the End of the Lane. Erica and her mother were going on vacation. Mom had made plans for them to visit Aunt Jill. Aunt Jill lived in a quaint little town near the ocean. The drive to Aunt Jill's would take them several hours. The sky was gloomy as they departed. When they finally got on to the interstate, it was already late afternoon. As they headed north, it started to rain. Erica's mom flipped on the car's windshield wipers. At first, just big, fat droplets splashed slowly against the windshield. But then suddenly, the sky opened up, and raindrops began to pound against the car fast and furious. 
It's raining buckets, said Erica's mom. I can hardly see. Maybe we should pull over, Erica said. Erica was scared. They were still several hours from Aunt Jill's house, and worst of all, they seemed to be stuck in the middle of nowhere. Oh, look up there, Erica's mom said. She was squinting, trying to see through the rain. There's an inn up ahead. Perhaps we could stay there tonight. Erica felt relieved as they pulled up to a quaint farmhouse. It was white with red shutters and a big friendly red door. The house looked very inviting. Erica and her mother grabbed their suitcases and rushed through the rain to the front porch. Thankfully, the porch was covered, providing shelter from the downpour. Mom rang the doorbell. Before long, they heard footsteps in the hall. The door opened. Welcome, said the innkeeper as she opened the door. Please come in and make yourselves at home. We'd like a room for the evening, said Erica's mother. I sure hope you still have one available. Certainly, dear, the innkeeper said. This is quite a storm we're having. It sure is, said Erica. The lady led the travelers to a cozy upstairs bedroom. Erica was pleased to see a giant bed with a wonderful fluffy comforter. As she listened to the thunder outside, she could hardly wait to snuggle under the warm, dry covers. The next morning, Erica awoke to the sound of birds chirping and the sun shining. The terrible storm was over. Erica and her mother walked downstairs. The inn's parlor looked even lovelier in the bright morning light, but there didn't seem to be anyone around. Hello! called out Erica's mother. There was no answer. Erica and her mother did a quick search around the house, but there was no sign of the lady that had let them in last night. Erica's mother shrugged her shoulders. Maybe she went out for groceries, she said. We can just leave some money and a note. She rummaged through her purse for some cash and a piece of paper. She wrapped the note around the money, and then they were off again. After driving a few miles down the road, they stopped for gas. A young man ran out from the gas station to fill up the car. Good morning, the young man said. Good morning, said Erica's mom. Fill her up, please. Ah, you betcha, said the young man. Say, you didn't happen to drive through that terrible storm last night, did you? As a matter of fact, we did, said Erica's mom. Luckily, we spotted that charming little inn just a few miles back. The young man stopped pumping gas and turned to look at them. You don't mean the white farmhouse with the red shutters and the big red door, do you? He asked. Why, yes, Erica's mother replied. The hostess was so nice. It was the most pleasant night's sleep I've had in ages. It's too bad that she wasn't there this morning. That's Mrs. Flattery, the young man said. His face had turned a ghostly white. She was asleep in bed when her inn burned down. That was just a few days ago. Erica's mother thought the young man was joking. But she could tell from the look on his face that he was not. Let's drive back, Mom, said Erica. It'll only take a few minutes. They paid the young man for the gas and turned the car around. Erica held her breath as they approached the inn. When they pulled into the driveway, she could not believe her eyes. Sure enough, the old farmhouse was burned, just like the young man said. How can that be? Erica stammered in disbelief. W we were just there. The porch that had protected them from the rain was now sagging and burned. The windows were all broken. Carefully, Erica made her way to the opening where the front door used to be. Then she gasped. There before her was the hall table. And on the table, still neatly wrapped around the money, was the note that her mother had left. Do you know what a banshee is? A banshee is a female spirit from Irish folklore. It has been said, as you'll hear in this story called The Banshee and O'Dowd, that a banshee's cries and wails can be heard as a warning that someone is about to die. You better not doubt that banshees are real, though, or you might be next. Aiken O'Dowd was a man of few beliefs. He did not believe in leprechauns. He did not believe in fairies. 
He did not even believe in Santa Claus. Only children believe in such silly things, he would say. The only thing Aiken O'Dowd did believe was that he knew everything. O'Dowd was a reporter for a very important newspaper called The Truth. He thought this was the best name for a newspaper, for he did not believe in anything but the truth. I have a great story for you, O'Dowd's boss said one day. He told Aiken to go to the Irish village of Limerick and write a story about the banshee that lived there. I don't believe in banshees, said O'Dowd. But the next day, Aiken O'Dowd packed a bag with some clothes and his notebook. He boarded the train to the village of Limerick. O'Dowd grumbled to himself during the entire train ride. I don't believe in banshees, he said. The other passengers looked at him. Banshees, ha! he laughed. The other passengers moved away. O'Dowd did not care. He just grumbled louder. The train arrived in Limerick, and O'Dowd grumbled as he walked into the Cloverleaf Inn. But he got right to work and began to ask questions about the Banshee. The innkeeper told O'Dowd how the Banshee had taken the life of an old woman who lived at the edge of the village. "'An old woman?' asked O'Dowd. "'How do you know that a Banshee had anything to do with it?' "'That night we all heard screaming just before the old woman fell.' cried the innkeeper. It was the howling of the banshee. I don't believe such a thing, said O'Dowd. It must have been the wind. I'll go talk to the other villagers. O'Dowd was angry that his boss had sent him to this village. He grumbled about the silly banshee story as he walked out of the inn. Although O'Dowd didn't believe in banshees, he wanted to learn more about the old woman. He went to visit the old woman's neighbors at the edge of the village. Timmy O'Daly lived next door to the old woman. I'm so excited. I've never talked to a reporter before, Timmy said. Timmy told O'Dowd about the screaming that he had heard the day the old woman had disappeared. Are you sure it wasn't just the wind? asked O'Dowd. I've never heard the wind sound like that before, replied Timmy. Timmy went on to tell O'Dowd about the legend of the Banshee. She's a fierce spirit, the Banshee is, he said. Nobody sees her, but you know she's coming when you hear her scream. Her victim never hears the scream, though, so if everyone around you hears screaming and you don't, you're in trouble. She screams, you say, said O'Dowd, taking notes. Spirit, scream, in trouble, yes, I see. Thank you for your time. O'Dowd finished writing down what Timmy had said, but he did not believe a word of it. O'Dowd walked back into the village and decided to visit the local shopkeepers. As he walked through the village, people stopped talking to each other. They tipped their hats or nodded politely. O'Dowd stopped to talk to Minnie O'Connell, who ran the bakery. She looked him in the eye and said, The Banshee's real, you know. You city folk think you've seen it all, but you've never seen anything like the Banshee. O'Dowd scribbled Minnie's words into his notebook and laughed. He thought she was trying to scare him. It did not work. O'Dowd woke up the next day grumbling. He did not want to talk to any more silly villagers about their silly beliefs. Getting dressed, O'Dowd walked outside to get some breakfast. Good morning, O'Dowd, he heard the villagers say. They laughed at him. O'Dowd found a restaurant and asked the waiter for a cup of coffee. Did you hear the screaming last night? The waiter asked as he brought a cup of hot coffee to the table. O'Dowd took a sip of coffee and grumbled. He had not heard any screaming during the night. I'm sure it was the wind, he said. The waiter bent down close to O'Dowd and said, I didn't hear any wind last night, O'Dowd. The other customers could not stop talking about the screaming, so O'Dowd paid the waiter and left the restaurant. But O'Dowd could not forget what the waiter had said. He thought about the screaming that the villagers had heard in the night. He wondered why he had not heard the noise. Near the village square, O'Dowd saw Timmy O'Daly and Minnie O'Connell looking at him. He saw that the whole village was there, all looking at him, with strange looks on their faces. 
A few people covered their ears as if they heard a very loud sound. I think your wind is back again, shouted Timmy as he covered his ears. O'Dowd still could not hear anything. He looked around and around. He began to feel dizzy. He could not breathe. Suddenly, O'Dowd was struck down by the banshee. The villagers gathered around the man that they had all called O'Dowd and watched the pages of his notebook blow away in the wind. Sometimes when we really care about someone, we'll do whatever it takes to look after them. You won't believe your ears when you hear what one young man had to do in order to take care of his sick mother. Gather round and listen to this story, called Ghost Cave. Riley counted his workers. Then he yelled, Hey, line up, men! Riley was the foreman of a road construction crew. It was his job to make sure everyone reported on time for work. This morning, he counted an extra worker, a teenage boy. The boy stepped forward. My name's Tate. I'm here for the job. Riley studied the boy. He did not look healthy. He was skinny and he was pale. Hey, I can't have kids running around here getting hurt, Riley said. I won't get hurt, sir, said Tate. I can do the work of three men. Tate grasped the bumper of Riley's truck with one hand. He took a deep breath and lifted the front of the truck clear off the ground. He took another deep breath and picked the truck up over his head. Riley could not believe his eyes. Okay, okay, son, you got the job. Tate worked hard all day. He never took a break. He didn't even stop for lunch. At the end of the day, Riley handed out pay envelopes to all the men. Tate put the envelope in his pocket and walked toward town. The next morning, Tate reported early for work. He worked hard all day, collected his pay envelope, then set off for home. On Saturday, Riley went into town for a haircut and a shave. So, how's the work coming along? the barber asked. Eh, fine, fine, said Riley. We got more dug in the last few days than we have all summer. The barber raised his eyebrows. Is that so? What's causing your men to work so much faster all of a sudden? Oh, it's not the men, said Riley. It's a boy. I got a new kid working on a crew. He can't be more than 15 or 16, but he's strong as an ox. Maybe you'll know him. His name's Tate. Oh, yes, the barber nodded. Tate, he's an odd one he is, and you're right. He doesn't look older than 16, but he has to be at least 20. Lived here all of his life. You think that boy is 20, Riley asked. Why, yes, said the barber. I remember when he was born, but the funny thing is, he doesn't seem to get any older. Once he got to be a teenager, he just stopped aging. He's even worn the same clothes for the last five or six years, and he never needs a haircut. Riley frowned. That's uh, very strange. You think I should talk to him? Nah, leave him be, said the barber. He's a good boy. He works hard. He has to, really. His mama's very sick, and she needs him. Riley left the barber shop. Outside, he saw two women, Mrs. Malloy and Mrs. Winslow, chatting in front of the dress shop. Good day, ladies, he said. But the women were too involved in their conversation to notice him. The poor boy will miss his mama, Mrs. Winslow was saying. Poor Tate said Mrs. Malloy. Tate, Riley wheeled around. Eh, pardon me, ladies, I don't mean to eavesdrop, but were you just talking about a thin, fair-haired boy named Tate? Yes, his mother passed away this morning, said Mrs. Malloy. She's been sick for a very long time. Last week she took a turn for the worse and just kept getting weaker and weaker. It's a blessing, really, that the poor old lady no longer has to suffer, added Mrs. Winslow. But Tate will be heartbroken. I don't know what will become of the poor boy. Suddenly, Mrs. Malloy's son came running up. Mama, Mama, the boy shrieked. You'll never guess what we saw. Slow down, Jimmy, said Mrs. Malloy. Tell me what happened. Jimmy took a deep breath. We were playing near the creek. Tate walked by, but he looked funny. He was even more pale than usual. I could see right through him, Mama. Jimmy, 
said Mrs. Molloy sternly. Don't make up stories. I'm not, said Jimmy. I tried to talk to him, but Tate just walked past like he didn't hear me. Probably thinking about his mother, said Mrs. Winslow. We followed him, Jimmy said. He went out past the old mill and down to the creek, and then he walked right into the ground. Jimmy, said Mrs. Malloy. It's true, said Jimmy. It was a cave. I never even knew it was there. Tate got paler and paler as he walked inside, and then he just disappeared. I've got to catch up with the other kids. They went to tell the sheriff. Jimmy raced down the street. <laughs> Riley laughed. Hey, he has an active imagination. Tate is certainly pale, but I, I don't think he could actually disappear. On Monday morning, Tate did not come to work at all. It wasn't like Tate to not show up for work. Then Riley remembered Jimmy's story. So he put the crew to work, then set out down the road past the old mill. He saw that the sheriff had gotten to the cave before him. I came to see if uh, Tate was okay, Riley told the sheriff. You're too late, the sheriff pointed inside the cave. There, right in the middle of the cave, was a skeleton. Tate's clothes and work boots were rotting in a heap around the brittle bones. Ah, that can't be Tate, said Riley. He was working for me last week. The sheriff nodded. Well, I've seen him around town, too. I'd say this skeleton has been here about five years. Funny thing is... Five years ago is just about the time Tate stopped getting older. He started looking paler and skinnier every week. I found this in his pocket. The sheriff unfolded a piece of paper. It's his mother's grocery bill, paid in full. Tate always took good care of her. And he kept taking care of her even after he was dead, Riley said. He pointed to a date on the paper. Tate had paid the bill on Saturday, the very day his mother died. I guess he can stop taking care of his mother now, said Riley. Now here's a story called Night Coach. It's about an old-fashioned cattle rustling cowboy who gets the scare of his life one night out in the desert. Those desert spooks really can turn your hair white. It all started when our cowboy, Red, finished up a cattle drive. He was heading back to his family's ranch as the sun went down when his horse, Gypsy, reared up and threw the cowboy to the desert floor. Red kicked the dusty, dry dirt with the toe of his leather boot. This was not a good time for old Red to get thrown from his horse. Gypsy! Red called out. Gypsy, come back here! It was useless. Red knew Gypsy was long gone. That horse, she sure gets spooked a lot, the cowboy said. Red took off his brown ten-gallon hat. The sun beat down on the top of Red's head. He ran a hand through his mop of bright orange hair. That's where he got his name, on account of his hair being reddish-orange. He looked at the sky. Night would soon fall upon the desert. Red had been riding through the desert to see his brother Pete. And then all of a sudden, something startled Gypsy. Eh, must have been a rattler, Red thought. He'd not seen one, though. Whatever it was, it sure scared Gypsy. After she tossed Red from her back, she ran away. Now Red was stranded and did not know what to do next. Red surveyed the landscape. He saw miles and miles of sand all around him. But wait, what was that? Red was surprised to spot a small cabin away in the distance. A small trail of smoke rose from the chimney. Red knew that once the sun went down, temperatures in the desert would drop, so he started walking. It was plenty dark when Red finally made it to the cabin, but he could still see a light inside. He rapped at the door. An old man opened the door just a crack. Uh, can I help you? He asked cautiously. Well, why, yes, sir. I, I hope so, sir, Red said. Seems my horse got spooked and, and left me stranded here. I was hoping you might be kind enough to give me shelter for the night. Well, come in, the man said. I, I suppose you're hungry. He walked over to his kitchen and pulled some cans from a small pantry. While enjoying a supper of beans and stew, Red looked around the cabin. It was filled with books and papers. And then the old man spoke. It's not too late to get the night coach into town, 
the man said. You could buy a new horse in the morning. Really, said Red. You just need to walk out to Red Rock Hollow, the man said as he showed Red a map. That's where there's an opening in the rocks big enough for a coach to pass. It's the most direct route through the valley. Red thanked the old man for his suggestion and for the fine meal, too. And then Red grabbed his hat and set out walking. Red walked along rock formations which served as his guide. He noticed that the temperature had fallen. It was cold outside. There was an eerie feeling in the air that night, Red noticed. Hmm, maybe Gypsy had the right idea, he thought with a shiver. Red rounded a bend and saw a red rock hollow before him. Suddenly, he noticed two tiny dim lights shining through the hollow. The lights were steadily growing bigger and brighter, and Red realized that this must be the night coach. He jumped out into its path and shouted, waving his hands. The coach was really moving along. He didn't think the coachman saw him at first, but sure enough, the coach stopped. Now, Red had seen a lot of coaches in his day, but he had never seen one like this. It was black from top to bottom. The horse pulling the coach was jet black and decorated with a plume of black raven feathers. The black leather reins fastened to the horse were held by the driver, who did not say a word and was draped in a heavy black cloak. Well, this is the darndest coach I've ever seen, Red thought to himself, but he went ahead and hopped inside anyway. Red did not feel comfortable sitting inside the eerie coach. In no time, the black horse was galloping at full speed. Its hooves thundered across the desert floor like giant explosions. I wonder why the hurry, Red thought. He decided he better say something to the driver. He leaned right out the window. Well, evening, my good man, he shouted. I thank you kindly for the ride. How long will it take us to get to town? He waited for a reply. The driver said nothing. Well, it shouldn't take too long at this pace, Red continued. There was a big lump in his throat. He felt uneasy. Something was definitely not right. The coach sped on into the night. Uh, perhaps you could just let me off right here, Red called to the driver. I believe I may be on the wrong coach. He was relieved when the driver finally began to turn around. But relief turned to horror. The driver had no face. He raised his hand at Red as if to silence him. Red looked at his hand to see it was the bony hand of a skeleton. Red's eyes grew wide as wagon wheels. Now I know I'm on the wrong coach, he said. Out of sheer terror, he closed his eyes and jumped. The next thing he knew, Red found himself laying in a bed. His brother Pete was there as well as Pete's wife and a doctor. Red, Pete said when he saw his brother's eyes open up. Red, we ain't going to be able to call you Red no more. Your hair done turned pure white. It's like you seen a ghost or something. Uh, ha, 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 how'd I get here, Red stammered. He was still in a bit of shock from his ride. Why, the night coachman, of course, Pete said matter-of-factly. Red began to shudder. It was all coming back to him now. He could still see the black coach and that horribly awful black horse. He did not even want to think about that driver without a face and the skeleton body. Yes, sir, Pete continued. Said he saw you lying there in the desert flat on your face. He stopped to see if you was all right and bring you on back here. But don't you worry none, Pete patted Red's shoulder. We've arranged to have another coach take you on home. No, yelled Red. No coaches. A horse will suit me fine. Yes, a horse. Just find me a horse, would you, Pete? Well, sure thing, brother, sure thing, he said. Red thought for a moment. And make sure it's not black. Sometimes good people do evil things, and evil people do good things. It's up to you to decide what is what in this story called The Shipwrecker's Daughter. I think you'll agree that it's a chilling tale of fate and circumstance. Chambercombe Manor was a very large house on the rocky coastline of Devonshire in England. For three hundred years it was haunted by the ghost of a young woman. One owner after another reported seeing the young woman. No one ever reported being afraid of the ghost, 
but no one ever knew who she was, not for three hundred long years. It was only about a hundred years ago that the owner discovered a tiny little room that had been hidden away behind plastered walls. Inside the little room was a skeleton of a young woman. She was lying on a beautiful bed and was dressed in the clothes she had worn more than two hundred years ago. These clothes, which had once been soft and beautiful, were now dusty and fragile. The skeleton wore beautiful rings and necklaces, now dark with age. But no one knew the woman's name. No one knew why she had been hidden away in the tiny room for so many years. The skeleton was soon buried in a small cemetery in the village. But the sad ghost continued to walk up and down the halls of the old house. The question was, why was she there? In the 1600s, Chambercombe Manor was owned by Thomas and Mary Oatway. The Oatways owned a little shop where they sold all sorts of goods. What no one in Devonshire knew, though, was that the Oatways were wreckers. During stormy weather, when the Oatways knew that a ship was sailing by the coastline, they would light a fire on the shore. The captain of the ship would think that the fire had been lit to guide him to safety. These kinds of fires were commonplace during bad weather. But the Oatways would light their fires in a place that would make the ship's captain sail right into the rocky coastline. The ship would crash into pieces. When the sunken ship's cargo would wash up onto the shore, the Oatways would gather all the valuable goods and store them in a cave. The cave led to a secret tunnel that went right into their house. No passengers or crew ever lived to tell the story. One night long ago, the sky was black except for some occasional streaks of lightning. Thomas and Mary looked out to sea and saw a ship. They lit a big fire hoping to lure another boat into their trap. We need more goods for our store, said Mary. They piled on more and more wood. Soon they had built a blazing fire that would not go out in the rain. She's seen our fire, said Thomas. Her captain thinks this is the safe channel. Thomas and Mary stood in the rain and wind. They watched the ship roll and toss on the waves. They heard the crunch of wood as the bow of the ship struck the rocks. There she is, Mary. Thomas yelled through the rain, she's wrecked. Mary thought she could hear cries for help above the roar of the waves crashing and the rain falling. She closed her eyes and put her hands over her ears. She didn't like to think about the people that got hurt when she and her husband lured these ships to shore. They began to search for boxes and crates. Thomas set his lantern on a rock to pick up a box. The yellow rays of light from his lantern illuminated the body of someone lying face down in a shallow pool of water. There's a woman here, Thomas called. I think she's alive. Mary ran to help, and the couple pulled the woman from the water. Thomas leaned down and put an ear to her heart. She was still alive. Mary saw that the woman's face was badly cut from the jagged rocks. Her heart sank. She wanted to help this young woman. We can't leave her here. She said to Thomas, All right, Mary, we'll take this woman with us, Thomas said. He picked up the woman and carried her into the cave. They put the woman into Elizabeth's room. Elizabeth was their daughter. Thirteen years ago, the young girl had run away. Life in the tiny village and work in the store was not very exciting for her. She had not known about the fires, the shipwrecks, or the secret tunnel. The Oatways had never heard from Elizabeth again. Mary had cried for years before finally packing away her daughter's things. Mary guessed that this woman and Elizabeth would be about the same age. Maybe that's why Mary felt so bad. Mary sat by the woman lying still on the bed. She had cleaned the woman's face and wrapped her in bandages. But there was nothing else Mary could do. The lady was dying. What should we do with her body? Mary asked. I'm not sure, said Thomas. If we report her body, people will know we are wreckers. The couple sat next to the woman until she stopped breathing. <sighs> the sun was shining brightly through the windows. It was a beautiful day, but Thomas and Mary were sad. 
I guess we could bury her in our secret room, Mary said. Thomas thought for a while. You're right, Mary. We can plaster over the doorway, and nobody will ever know that she is there. We'll be safe from discovery. He lifted the woman's lifeless body and carried her to the secret room. Three days had passed. Mary was pouring tea when she heard a knock at the front door. Mary crossed through the hall and swung open the heavy door. Before her stood a tall, well-dressed man. His head was bandaged, and his arm was in a sling. "'Mrs. A Mary Oatway?' he asked. "'Yes, I am Mary Oatway,' Mary said. "'I am afraid I have very bad news for you,' the stranger said. "'May I please come in?' Mary invited the stranger inside. They sat and drank tea as the stranger began his story. Four days ago, I was on a ship from Ireland. Our ship was misguided, and we sailed into jagged rocks which lined your coast. I am the only survivor, he said. Mary's face turned pale. Thomas gripped the arms of his chair. Did the man know that they had built the fire that caused the ship to wreck? I am afraid I have some even worse news, the man said. Your daughter, Elizabeth, ran away to Ireland thirteen years ago. She had married a wealthy Irish gentleman. I met her on the ship that sunk. She told me her story. She told me that she missed you terribly and was returning home to visit. She wanted to surprise you, and she wanted to convince you to move to Ireland to live with her and her husband. The man paused before continuing. And your grandchildren. Mary was so grief-stricken, she fainted and fell from her chair. Thomas leaned over her as he himself tried to catch his breath after hearing this horrible news. Hundreds of years passed by. Construction workers were tearing down an old house in Ireland. In the debris of the house, they found a metal box which contained a letter. The letter was addressed to the owners of Chambercombe Manor in Devonshire, England. The letter read, Before I die, I wish to confess my sins. My good wife is now dead. I cannot join her unless someone knows what I have done. My wife and I lived for a number of years in Chambercombe Manor. We were blessed with a beautiful daughter, but she ran away when she was still just a girl. We later caused a ship to wreck and killed our own daughter as she traveled back to surprise us. We placed her body in a secret room in the manor, but we could no longer live in our house, for her ghost began to haunt it. In the end, we moved to Ireland in order to be near our grandchildren. May God forgive us. Signed, Thomas Oatway, 1690. Though Elizabeth's skeleton had been discovered many years earlier, now they knew who she was. Elizabeth's body was given a proper burial. After that, her ghost left Chambercombe Manor forever. What do you do when the woman you love has a secret? In this twisted tale, Bill learns the hard way just how dangerous a little curiosity can be. Have a listen to The Red Ribbon. Bill whistled a jazzy tune as he strolled through Central Park on his way to meet his girlfriend Sally. Tonight's the night, he thought excitedly. The snow on the ground crunched under Bill's boots, but he could smell spring in the air. Jingling the diamond ring in his pocket, Bill dreamed of a beautiful June wedding. Bill heard someone running his way. It was Sally. He took her in his arms and spun her around in the air, delighted to see the love of his life. Together at last, the couple settled onto a nearby park bench. Bill knelt on one knee in front of Sally. Sally, he said, you are the most wonderful girl I've ever met. I love you, and I want you to be my wife. Will you marry me? Sally choked back tears of joy and answered, yes, Bill, I will marry you. Bill gazed lovingly at his bride-to-be. He touched her flowing blonde hair. He stared into her deep blue eyes. He longed to kiss her ruby lips and her dimpled chin. His eyes continued downward and lingered on the red velvet ribbon that Sally always wore around her neck. 
Sally, Bill asked, why do you always wear that red ribbon? I must never take off my red ribbon, Sally replied sadly. Bill shrugged, forgetting about the ribbon. He lost himself in thoughts of their wedding day. Bill and Sally were married that June. Bill had a good job, and the couple bought a lovely house in a nice neighborhood. Bill bought Sally party dresses and jewelry and many pairs of expensive shoes. But Sally always wore her red ribbon, even when it did not match her elegant outfits. Bill thought this was odd and asked Sally why she did this. Sally smiled sadly and said, I must never take off my red ribbon. After a few years of marriage, Sally told Bill that she was going to have a baby. Bill was delighted. They talked together each night about what they would name their child and what sort of parents they would be. When the big day came, Sally said to Bill, Please tell the doctor that I must never take off my red ribbon. Bill was frustrated but promised he would tell the doctor. After the baby was born, Sally said to her husband, Thank you for telling the doctor I must never take off my red ribbon, Bill. Would you like to hold little Billy? Bill, Sally, and little Billy lived happily for many years in their lovely little house in the nice neighborhood. Little Billy was a curious baby and would often reach for the red ribbon around his mother's neck. Sally would take his little hands in hers and softly say, Mommy must never take off her red ribbon. After years of wondering about Sally's red ribbon, Bill came up with an idea. Their anniversary was fast approaching. He would buy Sally a beautiful necklace. She would surely take off that old red ribbon in order to wear a beautiful new necklace. Their anniversary arrived, and Bill took Sally to a fancy restaurant overlooking Central Park. They ate their meal looking out at the special spot where Bill had asked Sally to marry him. When they were finished eating, Bill gave his wife a small velvet box with a beautiful diamond necklace in it. Sally opened the box and smiled, her eyes filled with tears. Bill put the necklace around her neck and started to take off the old red ribbon. Sally quickly stopped him, reminding him, I must never take off my red ribbon. Bill sat back down with a huff and shook his head. He did not understand why the ribbon was so important. Later that night, Bill was still awake. He could not stop thinking about that old red ribbon. It was time he found out why Sally would not take it off. Bill quietly got out of bed and tiptoed around to Sally's side. He carefully pinched the ends of the bow on the ribbon. He slowly began to pull on the ribbon. The bow became smaller and smaller. The loops of the bow pulled through and only a half knot was left. Bill slipped his finger under the half knot and tugged. Zip! The red ribbon came undone and fell away. Pop! Sally's head came right off. It rolled onto the floor, bouncing in the moonlight. One large tear fell from Sally's eye as she whispered these last words. Bill, I warned you that I must never take off my red ribbon. How many of you have ever wondered what it would be like to have three wishes? I'd be willing to bet that many of you even have a pretty good idea of what your wishes would be. But have you ever considered what the consequences might be to the wishes you made? In this story called The Monkey's Paw, I think you might think twice before wishing for wishes. Mr. White held his front door open. Morris, come in. Mr. White's old friend, Sergeant Major Morris, stepped inside. Mr. White led him into the parlor. Mrs. White and their grown son, Herbert, sat before a crackling fire. Morris settled into a chair, and Mrs. White poured tea. So good of you to come, said Mrs. White. Thank you for inviting me, Morris looked around the parlor. 
It's so warm here, so safe, I can almost forget that the mysterious jungles of India lurk right outside this house. I can almost believe life has returned to normal. Normal? Mr. White studied his old friend's face. He looked worried. Or did he look scared? Has something happened to you, Morris? Asked Mr. White. Morris rubbed his hand across his chin. Friend, my life has nearly been destroyed by a monkey's paw. A monkey's paw? Mr. White frowned. I'm afraid I don't understand what you mean. Morris reached into his pocket and pulled out a dark object. It was a tiny, shriveled hand covered in fur. Mr. White peered down at the tiny hand. Morris, this is the cause of all your troubles? The withered paw of some small monkey? It's small and withered, yes, said Morris, but it's powerful. It has a spell on it. This paw grants three wishes to anyone who owns it. Three wishes? Mrs. White looked at the paw. It's magic, then. You may call it magic, Morris said. I call it cursed. Cursed, said Mrs. White, but that's silly. How can a wish be cursed? Very easily, said Morris, shaking his head. Whenever we make a wish, greed clouds our judgment. I wouldn't let greed cloud my judgment, said Herbert White. I would think the whole thing through. I would know exactly what I was wishing for. I thought I was smarter than the monkey's paw and its magic, Morris said. I was dreadfully wrong. Then you've made your three wishes? asked Mr. White. I have, said Morris. And if I had a fourth wish, I'd use it now. I'd wish with all my heart I'd never seen this paw. It's terrible, I tell you. Morris flung the monkey's paw into the fireplace. No, said the son Herbert. He grabbed a fire iron and fished the monkey's paw from the flames and flipped it onto the parlor floor. Oh, I can't watch you ruin your happy home, Morris rose to his feet. You have a fine family and a good life, he told Mr. White. If you want to keep them safe, you'll toss that cursed paw back into the flames. Mr. White walked Morris to the door. When Mr. White returned, Herbert said, What should we wish for first? Nothing, his father said. Morris is a smart man, and I think we should take his advice. I live in a fine house with a family I love. I have nothing to wish for. But this fine house isn't completely ours, said Mrs. White. We still owe two hundred dollars to the bank. Wouldn't our good life and fine family be that much better without debt hanging over our heads? Think how happy you'd be to hand two hundred dollars to the banker, father, said Herbert. I don't know, Mr. White said. It would be nice to own this house. Mr. White stared at the monkey's paw. Then he took a deep breath. I wish for two hundred dollars. Oh, Mrs. White said. I saw it move. Did you see it? The monkey's paw moved. It heard your wish, father, said Herbert. Now the wish will come true. Nonsense, said his father. The wind moved it. The monkey's paw is no more magic than I am. He scooped up the paw, then he put it into his desk drawer. Let's forget about this withered paw and go to bed. It's been a long night. The next morning, though, Herbert had not forgotten. The two hundred dollars may come today while I'm at work, he said as he left for his job at the factory. Don't spend it all before I get back. That evening, Herbert didn't come home from work. Mrs. White was very worried. Then a knock sounded at the door. Mrs. White opened the door. A man from Herbert's factory stepped into the hall. There's been an accident, the man told Mr. and Mrs. White. Herbert got caught in the machinery at the factory. We couldn't save him. Mr. White stared at the man. Herbert is dead? The man nodded. We're very sorry. We hope this will help ease your suffering a bit. The man handed Mrs. White an envelope. Mrs. White's hand trembled as she opened it. Oh, no! Oh, no! She flung the envelope to the floor. The packet from Herbert's factory held two hundred dollars. Where is the paw? Mrs. White ran into the parlor. I've put it away, Mr. White said. It will do us no more harm. But we have two more wishes, cried Mrs. White. We can wish him back. We can have our sweet Herbert back. 
"'Do you really think that's wise?' asked Mr. White. "'After what just happened, do you believe anything good can come from making more wishes?' "'Well, don't you want your son back?' asked Mrs. White. "'Well, of course I do,' said Mr. White. He unlocked his desk drawer and pulled out the monkey's paw. He closed his eyes. "'I wish for my son,' he said. "'I wish my son Herbert would come back!' Thunder cracked outside the window. "'It hurt you,' whispered Mrs. White. "'Our Herbert will come home.' Mr. and Mrs. White heard footsteps outside. "'Herbert!' shouted Mrs. White. "'I'd know the sound of his walk anywhere.' Mrs. White raced through the hall and flung open the door. A tall figure stumbled towards her down the road. Herbert, she called. Lightning flashed. Mrs. White saw her son clearly. No, Mrs. White screamed. No, no, it can't be. She stared at the figure in the road. It was Herbert, but not Herbert as he had been that morning. He was bloody and disfigured. His clothes were torn and the skin on his face hung from his head. The White's wish had brought Herbert back the way he was after the accident. Mrs. White slammed the door. Mr. and Mrs. White heard Herbert's uneven steps. They heard his knocks on the door. What have we done? Mrs. White slumped to the floor. We have one wish left, said Mr. White. I wish, I wish my son was dead. The banging stopped. Mrs. White crept to the window and looked out. He's gone, she whispered. Our son is gone. And so are our wishes, Mr. White stared at the shriveled paw in his hand, along with our happy life. Mr. White staggered into the parlor and threw the monkey's paw into the roaring fire. Only this time, Herbert was not there to pull it out.